So I'd like to talk about the Holocene, the last 12,000 years of uh, uh, Australian history, and you will see uh, there have been many, many changes. So there are principles worth considering with respect to past climate. Australia is a disadvantage because you have a loss of uh, record through uh, deflation of the weathering and soil formation. There are long records of environmental smart in the ocean because it's more or less continuous. And uh, the marine records, these piles of sediments, just like the pages in a book, like the archives, I can correlate with what happened in the ocean around Australia, but elsewhere in the world. And then I can find terrestrial pollen, clay, uh, deposit from rivers in the ocean, so I can see and say what happened between the land in the ocean, and I can determine if there are lags and leads between the two. A characteristic of Australia is that the southern hemisphere is a maritime hemisphere compared to the northern hemisphere. It's bordered by three major oceans, and the Australian climate is dictated mostly by the ocean, what's happening in the ocean. And you have the Indo-Pacific warm pool north of Australia that borders around uh, Indonesian, Indonesia and other islands. And then there are two currents that are offshoots of this warm pool that circumnavigate Australia. So paleolimnology is looking at archives. And here we had a coring device with compressed air coming out like a rocket out of the wall. It's pretty exciting. The adrenaline is pretty good. We got four meters of sediment, and these four meters are just like pages in a book. And one centimeter represents two and a half years of deposition. Let's go at sea. And you can see here, close to 40 meter pipe, and the gray mud on the outside shows that the core has penetrated 32 meters of sediment. And again, the sedimentation rate is that one centimeter is about two, two years. Okay, we, so we've got these archives we can compare, and it's a lot of work. And uh, we got the course in many years ago, and uh, it took several years to extract the information. My principle, has been to take a sample, the little box uh, in white, and then I can extract a lot of things. In blue is the terrestrial archives, the pollen, the quartz from the wind, total organic carbon, barium and titanium, again produced by a transfer of dust in the clays. And then in, in mauve or pink, you have uh, all the other proxies that I can obtain from the core. Uh, it's been a time consuming, but I was able to say much more about what was happening in the ocean. Have a look at this map of Australia, and we actually went to look for many cores, and uh, it's been a very difficult exercise at times. Uh, to go at sea for one day is $50,000, and you have to be with a large group of people. So today I will talk about three cores, and these are the red rectangles, one in northwest uh, near Exmouth in uh, Western Australia, and then two in Victoria and, and South Australia. So you have to remember that uh, sea levels, 20,000 years ago, sea levels were about 125 meters below that today. You could walk to Tasmania, you could walk to uh, New Guinea. And you have a look at the periphery of Australia. Uh, you see where Darwin is and so on. And we, and this warm pool, <coughs> where there were a lot of people living there, uh, was very, very different. And then sea level rose sometime at, uh, of the order of one meter every 90 years. This is a lesson to take because we are witnessing a sea level change. I will talk about this lake there, uh, this core. And uh, you just, uh, the gray uh, uh, curve here 
indicate sea level change. And then we have a proxy to reconstruct sea surface temperature. And you have to look at the axis in thousands of years, going back to 30,000. So around 12,000 years ago, the temperature was much warmer than today. And you can see after that, it declined. And then we have another proxy to look at the amount of rainfall. I'm not going to explain how we obtain that. But uh, the summary is that at about 12,000, the monsoonal system started to appear in northern Australia. And ENSO started about 5,000 years ago. ENSO is the alternation between La Nina and El Nino. So these are the sort of uh, information that we can obtain. Holocene is defined as the last 11,700 years before present. And so you can see here uh, data for many sites around the world. And it's a, uh, a period when the climate was at it, an optimum. It was very uh, warm and wet. And then uh, for the last 10,000 years, in red shows periods in Europe, which were warmer and others that were colder and drier. The Holocene is divided in Europe, in the North Hemisphere, in several different periods. There are some magnificent, outstanding changes during that period from 12,000 years ago. Population in the, on the globe increased at an exponential uh, rate towards the end, and today we're even high. And the grazing and the crops of land are changed as well. And as a result, you have a huge amount of sediment transported by rivers, but that end up in uh, the ocean. So a lot of significant changes. Were they uh, related to or affected by climate? So there's another summary slide showing the Pleistocene, the period before 11,700. It was so dry and cold that a lot of vegetation animals were in the lowlands. And then at about 11,700, things went up the hill. And, uh, and this is for Asia. So human presence in Australia. Here are the black dots that are very important to realize. These are for human presence for the Holocene. People were everywhere, OK? And uh, Alan Williams and his colleague have said that there is a resource abundance in early to mid Holocene when, when there was a lot of uh, water and a longer patch residence time and a, a development of low level production. But we go back to other places. And those of you who know a bit about uh, Menindee and Lake Menindee and the Darling, you can see that. Uh, these lakes were filled with water, and uh, the black dots show people were inhabiting in the vicinity of these lakes. However, between that town and six town, people moved to the east. Today, this is a satellite image that shows you this area is extremely dry. People were living there because the climate was very different. So. I just, uh, I'm not an archaeologist, and I just read the literature by Peter Coots and, and others who looked at archaeological surveys in Victoria, and they actually found these mounds in the vicinity of uh, the River Murray. And here's a photograph taken in 1918 with a mound. Another survey, you've got Lake Borlach near Mount Hamilton. The black dots identify mounds everywhere People were living in agglomeration very close to rivers. Let's go to other places in Australia where you have earth mounds discovered in northern Australia, in South Australia, in Victoria, and New South Wales. And uh, here is a detailed uh, archaeological work done with uh, uh, some LIDAR uh, uh, photographs showing occupation around rivers, and the archaeologists say 
people were living in large groupings, villages, and hamlets around water bodies that suggest our ecological hotspot. But when? After 4,000 years ago. After that wet period, that, a warm period, another site in South Australia, again some mounds, and uh, the eldest mound date dates to 4,800, 4,200. After this very wet period, when and so, the alternative, alternative between La Nina and El Nino occurred, uh, they started to settle down, and not before. And uh, again, another flat plane with new radiocarbon dates published only a year ago, uh, showing a broadening of the diet in, this, uh, in response to environmental challenges and the sort of demographic social factors. So a very big change. And now I read a paper that was published last week uh, by Michael Bird and others from James Cook University that fire activities in northern Australia near Darwin uh, changed completely around four or five thousand years ago. So climate really affected human population. So during the Holocene, as a period of time that uh, stands out, as was wetter and warmer, the ocean currents were very different. The uh, East Australian current, I'm not too sure, but the lowland current south of Australia was uh, extremely strong and very warm and bringing tropical faunas uh, or where you don't find them today. And uh, the westerlies, this very important winds that bring the rain, were further south. So the climate was much, much more kind. So it was the equivalent of a continuous La Nina phase. And it lasted, the dates are here, you can read them. I have to thank many people, Peter Kershaw and, and many others. But I have to, especially in the middle of the slide here, mention all my colleagues and students who this work wouldn't have been presented here without uh, uh, their, their help and their interest, and their enthusiasm. And we definitely had an international laboratory. I think I thank you for your uh, attention. Please thank Patrick for his wonderful